Welcome. Good morning. Welcome to Belgrade Online, an online ministry of Belgrade Avenue United Methodist Church. Welcome to Belgrade Online. I'm Dan, the video editor of Belgrade Online. Thanks again for watching Belgrade Online. When I was a young guy, my parents made me take piano lessons. They thought it would be good for me, kind of like spinach for my fingers. And so there was this piano teacher, I think she was pretty old, which meant over 40 at the time. And she would come every week and she would give me these assignments to play. And, and every time I hit a wrong note, she'd cringe. And, and I just liked her face would like kind of pucker up, <laughs> just like a prune. And so sometimes I would hit wrong notes just to see it happen again. But I remember after a while, there was a piano recital. And the thing about piano recitals is you need to nail it, right? There's a stage and a great big piano a audience for waiting to hear you do. The problem was this, there was this guy named Craig and he had the same piano teacher. And they, they assigned the same song to both of us. It was called Through a Lighthouse Window. And so when they, the day came for the big piano recital, we both showed up and here was the intimidating thing. Greg was one of these guys that just got everything right. I mean, he was, he could rebuild engines. He was like probably trading corn futures and he was only nine. <laughs> <laughs> so Greg got out here, he was wearing a tux. He flipped his tails back behind him, sat down at the piano and just played through a lighthouse window flawlessly. He didn't make one single mistake. And, and when he finished and hit the last note, he raised his hands up above his head like claw fingers and the whole audience erupted. I mean, greatness had arrived and it was Greg. Well, I was the next guy to be up. And so I walked out in this, like this crazy cardigan sweater. My parents got it pennies and some pants and <laughs> I looked pretty lame. And, and I sat down at the piano and I looked at all the keys and there were so many of them. I didn't know where to start. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'll just start on all of them. You guys, it was horrible. My rendition of Through a Lighthouse Window was full of mistakes and flaws. It took me twice as long to get through it as it took Greg because I just fumbled my way. And, and, and at the end, when I hit the very last note, I didn't put my claw fingers over my head. I put my head on the keys. <laughs> I was pathetic. I literally I looked like Charlie Brown and, and one or two people gave one of these sympathy claps. But you know what, you guys? That was the last day I ever played the piano until I got to college. I had a dorm next to the recital hall and I'd go by the door and look inside and there was a huge black grand piano on the stage like this. And I would look through and when I looked through, I remember how ashamed I was when I sat down and played it. It looked like a hearse with a bunch of keys on it. And for a year, I passed that thing without going in. And then one day I saw that no one was inside and I walked up to the stage like this and I sat down to play through a lighthouse window. And you know what, you guys? I nailed it. I didn't make one mistake. I hadn't played it in 10 years. And when I hit my last note, 
I raised my huge claw fingers over my head. Like I wasn't Greg, but I was Bob and I wasn't afraid anymore. You know what? Playing it safe will steal your joy. If we over-identify with some of the mistakes that we've made, if we think our life is a recital, then, then we really miss some of the best parts that God built into us. If you've listened to good jazz, people just tap their foot. You get playing in the key of Jesus with your life and there's no wrong notes. What you end up doing is you learn how to live into the life God gave you to play your song instead of playing somebody else's song. I'll tell you, what I learned about the piano recital is this. There's a thing called finger memory. What our fingers will do is do what our mind tells it to do. And so this, these finger memory is these grooves that have been carved into our brain. They let our fingers go. It's why you don't need to look at your cell phone when you press a phone number. It's why you don't need to look at the keyboard when you're typing a message. And what we'll remember most is the things that we've done the most often. And I think the message of Jesus to his friends was this, to just remember him over and over and over. Make him your finger memory. And one of the friends Jesus had asked him, hey, what are we supposed to do? In the, the book of John, he said, this is your work, to believe in the one God sent. He didn't want us to do a recital. He wanted us to know him. And I hope that you'll be thinking about that in your own life, that the times where you felt like instead of just living out your faith, you were actually showing off your faith. It was a recital. You were trying to hit all the, the right notes. And then also reflect on the times where you've hit a couple wrong ones. You know, I teach a class in this very room. It's a failure class. And every year, I get three or 400 students that sign up for this thing. And we talk about failure. And what happens? Because what happens sometimes in our societies, we're talking about the big win and how awesome it was. And you think you're a winner if you won and you think you're a loser if you lost. But most of us are a combination of both. We hit a couple wrong notes. It doesn't make us a winner. It doesn't make us a loser. It made us a participant because we tried. We're not defined by our biggest failure. We're not defined by our biggest success. We're turning into love. That's the promise. If we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus instead of the audience, like, then what we'll do is we'll just not go for the applause of other people. You want a bunch of applause? Join the circus. You want Jesus? Find people who failed big. And then come to them. There's something that happens. Remember we were talking last time about catching people on the bounce. That's what we do. We tell people not what they want. Remember, we tell them who they are. And we're not the sum of all of our failures. So stop over-identifying with yours. And, and, and I know it can be a little bit intimidating. And in Acts 2 and 4, it said they broke bread together and they had all things in common. And their numbers were added to daily. What they had is people that were joining them over and over again. And what failure will do is it'll isolate us. It'll steal your lunch money. It will leave you all alone. Find somebody who's messed up. Tell them it ain't a piano recital. This is your life, and it's going to be marked with a couple things that go right and a couple things that go wrong. But don't isolate yourself from people. And it's kind of easy for us to do. Honestly, Sweet Marie and I, while we spend a lot of time with people, we're actually super, super private. That We have this, I'm this extroverted introvert. But I was thinking about the way that Jesus spent time with people, and he spent it together. He didn't do it in isolation. So we had an idea. We called this thing living room. We, we sent out a message on Twitter. We said, you know, we can fit about 30 or 40 people in our living room if they, they squeeze in tight. So next week at 10 a.m. on Thursday, we'll open it up. The first 40 people that sign up, you can come over to our living room and we'll just talk. We're not gonna live in isolation anymore. Well, uh, in the first four minutes on Thursday when it came, 800 people signed up. <laughs> And we, so we said to the first 40, well, come on over. What we did a short time later, I rented a, a, a building next to Disneyland. And we all met in this beautiful space. And we had these beautiful conversations about people who have failed, who'd messed up, but who got back up again. 
when we did this uh, gathering next to Disneyland, instead of having like breakouts in different rooms, you know what I did? I bought tickets to Disneyland for everybody. <laughs> It was awesome. We had people that were afraid of things meet at the Haunted Mansion. And I had a speaker speaking there. People that wanted to know about their future, they went to Tomorrowland. It was awesome. I was at Tom Sawyer Island. Somebody else was on Main Street that served the poor. I had like a rapper in the Magic Castle and somebody with Kid President in Toontown. There's something beautiful about going to beautiful places with people and having the right discussions at the right place. Remember that? Do that. Your small group right now is a safe place to have those discussions where you could just say, here's when the recital went really bad and what I did next. One of the uh, things that's happened to me in the past year, is I've been traveling to one of the schools that you guys helped build in Iraq. And I woke up in the morning and I, I couldn't see out of my right eye. I was like, oh shoot. <laughs> <laughs> and like a knucklehead, I went to five more countries before I got back to San Diego to see the eye doctor. The eye doctor said, buddy, you are the stupidest smart guy I've ever met before. I'm like, wait till you hang out with me longer. Like, and so we've been doing all these operations on it to see if we could make it work again. And before every operation, I asked the doctor, how much am I going to be able to see and when? And you know what? She won't tell me. She always says the same thing. She says, Bob, you're gonna see more. And because this is somebody I trust, I'm okay with that. And you know what the promise of scripture is to you and me? That we're gonna see more. We're gonna see more of Jesus in our lives the more we see Jesus in the lives of the people who have failed. Instead of moving away from them, our idea is to move towards them, not just to be nice, but to be Jesus. That's what he did. Constantly move towards people who'd messed up. Not to just say something really nice to them and pat them on the head, but to just say, I can join you in those failures. In fact, sometimes I wonder if God leads us towards failures so we know and need him more. There's something beautiful that'll happen. Well, one of the things that I've learned by going having the sight go out of this right eye is I know what my blind spot is. <laughs> It's half. I look at a crowd, I'm like, you guys aren't here. I'm talking to you. Know what your blind spot is. I pull up to like intersections these days, and I'm awesome at left-hand turns, but right-hand turns is like rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> Coming through. Know your blind spot. And some of the people that have been creeping you out don't know theirs. And so instead of like, feeling like you're, it's a recital and you're telling them what to do, just continue to remind them who they are, and there's something that'll be beautiful that'll happen in your life. There's a, a guy that uh, uh, was blind. I read the stories now about the blind guys. I'm like, these are my people. He, he was blind, and, and Jesus spit into some dirt and put it in his eyes, and he says, what do you see? And, and you know what? The guy leveled with Jesus. He said, you know what? I see people, but they look like trees. Man, if Jesus did something to heal my eyesight and, and it didn't work, I, I'd lie to him. <laughs> Literally, I wouldn't want him to look bad. But you know what? Jesus didn't have a miracle that misfired. What he wanted to know, I bet you, is can you get real enough with me to say I'm not fixed yet? And you know what? Because that guy got real with Jesus, Jesus touched him again. And I think one of the things that we might need as a community of faith is a second touch. Maybe you need a second touch. And it isn't about just saying a big prayer. It's get leveling with Jesus, getting real with some of the people you're with in, in your small group, and then just saying, you know, honestly, I need a second touch from God. And I, and I think what happens is we end up seeing more. One of the men that came out on this stage with me is a good friend of mine. His name is Lex. And Lex lost his sight in both eyes when he was eight years old. But by the time he got to college, you know what he figured out? He could run like the wind. So you know what Lex did? He went out for the track team. Now that seems like a bad idea to me, but do you know what Lex has? He's got a friend. And his friend runs in front of him and calls his name. You know what, on our last day here on earth, you and I, we're gonna have room for about eight people around our bed, nine if they're thin. 
And I figured out who my eight people are. And I've sent them all text messages. I said, you're one of the eight. They're like, what's that mean? I'm like, don't worry about it. But if you don't have eight friends, go find six. Do you know four fruit trees is just a bunch of fruit trees, but five fruit trees is an orchard? <laughs> who comes up with this stuff? Probably a lawyer like me who needs a tax break. Go find an orchard full of friends. And if you can't find five friends, you go find one friend that you can really level with to say, I need a second touch from God. And I'll tell you, beautiful things will start unfolding. You'll move off the recital stage and into community. You'll get real with each other. You'll understand that failure is what God uses to remind us of our tremendous need for Him. Well, Lex, turns out, could run pretty fast, but he could also jump pretty long. And he had to pick an event. And do you know the event he picked in the track and field? The long jump. Now that seems like a really, really bad idea. You run down a two and a half foot wide path for 110 feet, six inches. You jump off a board you can't see and throw your body towards a sand pit as far as you can. It seems impossible. Do you know what Lex has? He's got a friend. And his friend stands at the edge of the sand pit and calls his name, Lex, 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 Lex. And Lex just runs towards a voice he can trust. Well, Lex was evidently pretty good at the long jump. Do you know why? He went out for the United States Olympic team and he made it. Is that crazy? He literally went to Rio representing us. In the run up to the Olympics, there's an event called the World Games. And Lex was there with his friend. His friend stood at the edge of the sand pit and started calling Lex's name. And Lex ran as fast as he could. He jumped huge, but because Lex is blind, he doesn't always run in a straight line. And he was crooked when he took off and he missed the sand pit completely. And he crashed and burned on the concrete. Man, that's happened to you. That's happened to me. We jumped big for something that we wanted bad and, and we crashed and burned. I would be tempted if I was Lex to bail on the whole thing. I'd just say, I'm out. I jumped huge. I hit hard. I'm out. But you know what Lex has? He's got a friend. And his friend got him a new uni because he was mooning everybody. And, and he walked him back 110 feet, six inches, squared up his shoulders to the sand pit, went over there and started calling his name again, Lex. Lex, 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 straight, straight, straight. Lex uncorks the biggest jump of his life. Set the record, gold medal. You guys, I want us to jump further because we've fallen before. Not to hold back, not to be afraid, not to play it safe, but to just jump big. And if we do that, if we're willing to jump big into to the future that God has for us, notwithstanding the times that we've fallen in the past, if we're willing to catch people on the bounce, to find people that are creeping us out and engage them with love, do you know what? People will see Jesus. They'll look right through us. It's crazy. I'm a lawyer. I, I keep secrets for a living. And so when I come home at the end of the day, I can't tell Maria how my day was because I got to just keep it to myself. But you know what? We got one of these in our living room. And so what I do is I'll sit down at the piano and I'll just play for her how my day was. If it was a really great day, I'll be on the white keys. It's be kind of cheery. If it was kind of like an awkward, kind of sad day, I might be in the minor notes. And if it was a really bad day, I'll just bang all the keys. <laughs> and you know what she'll say to me every time? Tell me more about your day. And I think that's what Jesus says to us. Tell me more. Get real with me about where you really are at. He wants us to play our song. He doesn't need it to be a recital. Don't do it for the applause. Get real, get real enough with the people that are around you. If you don't have eight, go find one or two that you can just say, I need a second touch. And there's something beautiful that'll happen in you. You'll start realizing more about who God is turning you into. Not somebody standing on the corner with all the mistakes that you've made, but seeing who you're becoming. All right, you guys, thanks a million. And what a great time to share a couple stories with each other now. See ya.
enjoyed this week's episode of Belgrade Online. If it was life-giving and encouraging to you, please let us know by visiting our giving page at baumc.org give. Thanks again for watching and have a blessed week.